I really enjoyed um, the film. I thought it was really, there's something so, I'm not sure if it's to do with the fact that obviously we've all been kind of unable to travel this year, but it really captured a feeling of being on holiday or kind of being away. I thought the whole way, just even just seeing the colour of the sky and the feeling and atmosphere, I felt like I was kind of meandering around the streets of a, a city somewhere. I really, I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, but I'm going to begin by asking just about where this idea sort of, came from if it's been with you a while I was reading somewhere that it first came to you in a dream is that right yeah so I was really down um I I moved back to England about um obviously I was born and brought up here but I moved back here I'd say almost 10 years ago now or nine and I um and I was really down because this film that I've been trying to make for a while obviously I kept on having children so that sort of delayed things but this movie that was, and it was about to go, it just got, um, it was about to be greenlit. We had fully cast it and everything. And then it kind of fell apart. And I was just really down. And um, that night, that night, I just sat in my um, drawing room and I was just thinking about, you know, when you're down and you think about like the, the things that have got you to this place. And, but, and so I was really reflective. And I went to bed that night and had a dream about this woman walking in Luxor. And I'm not normally kind of a, um, a person that has crazy dreams every night, but then I do have them occasionally, they're pretty uh, profound. And I woke up in the morning and then I called the DP, who's a, a friend of mine, and she's not normally my DP, but we, you know, I, I knew we'd work together one day and we just sort of, um, we just sort of spoke about my dream and I was saying, I'm so bummed that my movie got, um, I've got to make something else before I make that movie and blah, blah, blah. And then I started talking about this dream and we, um, we were like talking about like unpacking the emotions and um, what it was about. And then, and then basically I said to her, you know, I think this would be a great movie. And she says, I said, would you want to shoot it? If we made it for nothing, would you come with me to Egypt? Cause I feel like at this stage I should just make a film um, for nothing basically and just get it done fast because, you know, it's always bigger budgets that, that hold you up. And so she said, yes. And then I, I called um, this Egyptian producer that I know and he randomly was literally down the road. Um, he's normally in Cairo and he said he'd do it. We had coffee and then Paul Webster, um, I texted him, he's my main mentor and I was like producer and he said he'd do it. So it like came together really fast. Um, which is crazy because normally that doesn't happen. No, because uh, I was I was wondering too because I uh, I was just mentioned obviously the the kind of the way I felt like I was there's a kind of slow pace to it like you really feel like you're going on the as the characters walk and roam, uh, roam through kind of look sore you feel like you're kind of on this kind of journey with them. Uh, I just wondered about the fact that this is very intelligent film about kind of. Um, uh, time and uh, past and the way the present meets up with each other and I, there's not any kind of filling we kind of have to fill in our own kind of gaps as an audience member I just wondered because it's quite uh, the pacing is quite slow and it has it doesn't give too much for the viewer it very much leaves a lot to our own interpretation was that something that you had to kind of fight for because I know as a filmmaker the producer pressure and stuff is always add it's always adds conflict adds conflict but this film like it was a very this felt quite like an intelligent filmmaker that really let the the audience use their own mind and I wonder if that was something you had to to really push towards when you were when you were trying to make this film. I didn't because because I made it for nothing literally we all pretty much worked for nothing we were there we had like our hotel and food paid for but basically everyone was in it and and I'm telling you this is why I was able to do this film so freely and it what was really interesting is that in the script it's even slower so the way I wrote the script was very much like I, I deliberately wrote like, she leaves the room, she closes the door, she walks down the stairs, she nods to the doorman, she goes down the steps, she gets in a taxi. It was so full on, but after a while, it's like it lulls you into this world. And, um, but then we shot it all, but then we realized there was just like way too much of her just like walking around. Like it was like so much. I mean, I, I could have had the movie like that, but also I'm, a, I'm kind of a discerning, I mean, I'm quite, um, you know, I had Soviet professors at film school. I went to NYU grad film. I left England and I left for, for graduate film school to the US because I, my dream was to go to NYU grad film and I luckily got in. 
and all our professors were like former Soviet professors. And they always they used to have these crits where you sit and they're like, why would anyone in like serious Russian accents, why would anyone want to watch this? You're so indulgent. You know, what, it's so insulting to be so indulgent. And then you really get that it's quite true there. It is quite, it's something interesting about that theory that it's actually almost like to be so self-indulgent and to not like actually push yourself to make sure that this is a very succinct piece is actually quite rude to make people watch something that then is just like you faffing about like you wouldn't you know so i i i am um, i really i really loved that i really took that away from those professors and i and i when i was making this we were like okay i i need to somehow keep the pace but not be like an experimental film where you're sitting for like a Matthew Barney, like seven hours, like watching the whales or, you know, right? I mean, like, it's not that movie, right? So, well, that's an amazing movie, but this isn't what this is. So how do you, how do you do that? And I think you do that because you have a low, uh, a low budget because you, um, we were very, very, I had a brilliant editor. I also edited it for a long time. And then she came along and we did like a 27 day, not even 21 day, just like, like we were laughing because she's we're both like in our 40s and we hadn't worked like this since like film school days you know where we were just like pulling all-nighters every night for like three weeks straight and then she had to go back to Chile uh, her name is Andrea um Andrea Tignoli she's really amazing anyway the point is that we were we we were very decisive in our editing we um had these screenings with people that I trusted but the people were also like come on Zanes I mean, another ruin for 50 minutes. I'm like, okay, 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 okay. And it was really hard because everything's really beautiful. But because I trust these people, because they're all into like, if you showed them Tarkovsky, they wouldn't fall asleep. Or if they fell asleep, it's because they were being lulled into a subconscious state of bliss, not because they were bored. Do you see what I mean? So because of, of that, I think um, we managed to do it. Also, the composer was key. Um, I'd seen Embrace of the Serpent. And I've never had score in a film. I'm scared of score because for me, score is very much like, you know, I feel like it's what filmmakers that don't know what they're doing put on to make the film better. And I'm always like, well, that's hopefully not what I am. So I, as a purist, I was always like diegetic music or very, and then with this, I work with pretty much, he's kind of a genius. He's also a screenwriter. He's just, he's this kind of amazing guy. And he's from Venezuela, living in Barcelona. And I explained to him that we need score. And Paul Webster told me this, and so did Mohammed Hefsi, the, Egyptian producer and they're all like really great minds and, they, and the, the producer was like listen you need score and the editor said that too because you you it's just some way a, a, like an access point um to enhance what's there rather than showing them what's there and that was really interesting for me because there's, there's a fine line and Nasqui the composer had done the music from Brisk the Serpent which was amazing because it was a spiritual film you know with the whole ayahuasca journey have you seen it? Uh, yes, I love it. I thought it was the, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was Oscar nominated. You know well, score, think, wasn't it? And the score, like you know, like, I got really annoyed because I read a review about it. Going with this one review, I didn't know who it was. Or she, she wanted a more trippy psychedelic sequence when you know he was going back to you know the origins of man universe, and I was like, well, clearly this woman. I don't want to judge. I'm totally judging here, but I don't want to judge. <laughs> but I thought it was so interesting because the film was really about this kind of very complicated subject. And you know, I've done a lot of work like that. It's since I was a teenager, but you know, I always wanted how you show that in a film. And somehow the music cut, like helped that mess, that helped that story without telling you, you know? It brought like another element to it. So this is what we tried to do with the score. The score again helped the pace, it helped, the mood we didn't want it to be like orientalist so like suddenly you'd hear like the call to prayer and like like a lute you know like I was really although I love I love that sound I love the call to prayer and I love the lute the oud, but I just I moved away and we used we used um instruments that were true to the region like the kora and um things like that but um we they were from like at the kind of the, the continent, but they were sort of like um, culturally, you couldn't really define the sound. See what I mean? 
Yeah, because I, I loved, well, I, I, yeah, I, I actually remember, it was Embrace of the Serpent, which I loved. I, I remember the score being great, even I saw it a few years ago. So, but mm. I was wondering, because, um, you know, we, we talk about a film that obviously might, it, it sort of can be sort of slow at times, but, but there's a real beauty to that. But what makes it and helps make it so absorbing is having someone like Andrea, um, and, Andrea, sorry, uh, in, the, in the lead role. I mean, she's so incredible isn't she as an actress I mean she's one of those performers who whenever she takes on a role I almost don't recognize her she almost she completely becomes whoever she's playing you must have been so thrilled when she signed up to the project to play that that central role in your film no I was really happy and I'm also happy because um we had a really good it was a very hard shoot it was 18 days with with I think two days off in the middle like like after every six days we'd have a day off and it was arduous um, and she was really cool because I was also like breastfeeding my three month old baby, my third child while I was directing. So she was really cool with that. And I think that's really important um, that you have like a supportive crew as well. And she, um, she's the kind of actress that if she, I bet you if she trusts you, I don't know what she's like if she doesn't trust you, but if she trusts you, <laughs> Um, you can create, like, actually, but she's so brilliant at everything. When, you know, when, because we had this relationship of trust, basically, we, we were able to um, have a really, like, wonderful rapport. But no, no, because obviously we're talking about sort of working with Andrea, but, but Kareem is a second time working with him. Um, mm -hmm. That must be great as well to have a, a kind of friendly face on set as well, someone you've worked with before, someone you know. And I interviewed him just early this morning. He's a very very engaging person. I really enjoyed our chat. Yeah, I mean, he's an, I don't know if he said this, but he's an old friend, so. Yeah. He's very, uh, he, uh, yes, he made, yeah, he, well, he, I, I knew he was a, a friend of you, but I thought that might have come around, uh, come about from working together the first time. Yeah, yeah, we met, we met working and then we became good friends. So it was just really easy having him around. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah. Um, I was wondering too, um, you mentioned just now that you were, obviously you had a three month old when you were shooting. I mean, I've got a three month year old puppy and I'm finding it really difficult to focus on my work. How did you manage with, to have Well, I had, that... had two other children on set. Yeah. Really? I mean, that must have, I mean, to have, was that quite a challenge for you to kind of be directing? Because I've been on set and directors are involved in every kind of aspect and at the same time have other commitments elsewhere. How, how was that kind of balancing act for you? I think, I think when you just, you just do it, I looking back, I wonder how I did it, but I think when you're in it, you just do it, you know? Um, and I, I, I think, you know, when you have children also, you, um, your brain just has to deal with many things at the same time, you know? So you, you're able to do that. And I think that, you know, I had a wonderful, someone helping me with my child on set who was really, really good. Again, like, you know, my, the, the baby Kareem was really like in love with Andrea, which was really nice. His vibe also made everyone really mellow. Then my other two children, like they would be, you know, it was just, and then my DP had her kids. It was like a really nice kind of vibe. Like I, I really hope that next time I make a film, I can have something similar where it's quite kid friendly in a way. I think the director's the person also set, who also sets that tone, you know, because it's, it's how you want your set to be run and, you know, yeah. And you mentioned it was an 18 day shoot. I don't know that much about the making of movies, but I know that's not a very long time. So that they're must not, have... Like, they're not, my, my first one was 23 and that was considered a genius feat. <laughs> so I just, I always thought, oh, well, I, I know I go back to 23. I'll have at least 40 next time or 40 or 50, you know? And I was like at 18. Sometimes my, my brain would melt. Um literally because they'd say okay you have one hour left in this ruin it's closing we can't afford to come back here and there's like 50 german tourists we couldn't shut it down and you have to shoot the scene in all the scene which is like you know i'm pretty uh, efficient so let's say suddenly from like six shots it would go down to three shots to then to two so you basically have a wide and something you can cut away to so you can get out if there's a disaster in the editing room. And you know, it would be like that, you know, I suddenly had to like, and I, be, like, I, like in the, in the, in the scenes when she's in the, when she's the doctor and there's that like new age tourist group that for, and the woman falls, I think I shot that scene 
in 20 minutes with directing the 15 people that were in it. You know, it was pretty intense. And sometimes you just feel your brain like melting, but then it was okay. Like we get through, I know. Yeah. Um, I was wondering too, I mean, obviously it's such a kind of cliched statement when people say that a, a setting is like another character, but the, I mean, it's literally the title of your movie, but it really felt like not Egypt, but not just Egypt, but ancient Egypt was such an important part of this story, wasn't it? Even just their relationship with, with time and their, their, the non-linear kind of approach they have to stuff seems quite... Uh, like it had a real kind of uh, impact on the on the way this story was told. How how essential was the the, the setting and 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 being and particularly kind of a, ancient Egypt? It was a starting point. It was a starting point of the film. You know, one thing that apparently I'm all right doing with when I make a film is I'm I'm apparently I'm good at like um, um, a sense of place. You know, I always like my first movie as well. It's like people get really nostalgic for the old New York. It's like, it, I mean, I might as well call that film New York looking back. I just thought, God, I should call that film New York. Um, it's, it's just, so I, there are two things going on and make sure I finish both points. Number one is in the dream. Okay, I, I knew I wasn't gonna do this for much money and I'm a very aesthetic person. So I love production design, but not, um, production design, which is um, gratuitous, production design that pushes the story. But obviously, if you're making a film in 18 days and you have zero budget, then it's great that you have these ruins. So I knew that I wanted to, to put the story in ruins. Why did I want to put it in ruins? Because in the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa, which is often in, in, in some sort of turmoil or near, the country you're in is, has a border with somewhere in turmoil and there's a spillover. There are all these ancient sites. And in these ancient sites, you find a stillness and a quality of time which is indescribable, which you can only really see on camera, which I hope to have caught here. So, you know, you go, for example, another place, you go to Petra and there's no one there, but there'll be four American generals who have come over from Iraq, you know, because they were like, this is literally in the Iraq uh, um, war, um, in, the, you know, in Iraq, that there would be like American generals, then you'd have like loads of people from Oxfam and NGOs who were also in the region. And I found that really interesting that, you know, these, these ancient sites, which were monuments to something in the past, show the cycles of history, cycles of empire, which is really essentially what we're talking about. Why is she in that area? There's, a, there's you know, there's, an, there's, there's, there's a geopolitical instability created by various empires, let's call them. And, you know, so it's all really tied in, but in a very beautiful way that only film can show. Because the problem with film at the moment is that I don't know why, I really don't, but film is not being used to its full potential because a film can show a place. If you, and the place can tell a story, you know, just through a few shots. And it's about, you know, Non-linear, yeah, non-linear time, ancient civilizations, places where people have worshipped for, you know, Luxor Temple, um, when it, you know, had been worshipped for, you know, for, 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 you know, uh, you know, thousands of years, and then you had this mosque that was built above it when it was covered in sand. So the archaeologist uh, Salima told me that then people worshipped in the mosque, and then when it was found again, um, and then. And then when they took off all the, um, when they excavated around the mosque, they realized that it was Luxor Temple. So this place has been worshiped continuously for 2000 years. So the vibes there are insane because whether you're spiritual or not, people have gone there asking for things, uh, giving thanks, and you can't help but feel that residue. So yeah, I think that all this was really important. Whether it was ancient Egypt or not, for me, it could have been any ancient site. However, ancient Egypt is like, at like, ratched it up a bit because obviously they have such an amazing philosophy. There was such a um, identity. Like the more I researched, the more I realized why instinctively, instinctively I had chosen it. It's because, you know, they're all about the battle of light and dark and birth and rebirth and all these things, which is essentially what she's going through. And those battles are reflected. You know, her battle is that battle as well. You see what I mean? And it's about like, you know, her looking for some kind of redemption in herself and, and that story is everywhere. So it's really, it was really interesting actually to be there. So I think it started with like an instinctive thing and then the more I unraveled, the more intellectual I got. And then when I discovered the Freud connection, I was like over the moon, the idea that Freud felt that archeology span um, was very similar to, to like, um, psychoanalysis because when you 
when you dig, you're digging in the mine that like mirrors each other. And in his, his office in Hampstead has tons of little, you know, um, Egyptology, you know, um, artifacts from ancient Egypt. And like, he was obsessed, you know, so, and then, then Jung went off on a whole other angle, but yeah, that, I mean, it, it, I felt that it was, it was almost like, sometimes I feel like I was psychically, psychically directing this movie almost, you know? I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> No, no, no that, that's great. I love that. No, because it's true. It's, it's, you do get a sense, I think, for does, whether you're spiritual or not. I mean, even Kareem was telling me earlier that at times he, when he was on set, that, that definitely impacted the actors because he said they thought sometimes it felt like the statues were talking to them or whispering to them. So I think there was a kind of... Oh, they were. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the gaffers and the grips were like leaving offerings. I mean, literally everyone got into it, you know? I'm, and at one point I thought, God, they're gonna think I'm crazy because we went to this temple that like, it's Sekhmet and she's like a real force of nature. And I was like, she did not want us in that. I felt like, oh my God, something bad is gonna happen in the, what, if we shoot here. It was like a Stephen King. I was like, what are we gonna do? So we left and I had a conversation with my DP and we're like, okay, maybe if we go in there with the energy that we are thankful that we're there and we'll leave something. And I'm like, how are we gonna explain this to the crew? They're gonna think like, they're gonna think we're insane, you know? Um, and then we told them, and then we worked out what the ancient ritual was of Egyptians before they went in to pray in those places. And we just kind of mimicked that. And we did that. And then the vibe was like singing. I, I can't explain it. And you sound really bizarre saying it, but it was really fun. And then they all got into it. The whole crew got into it. And Kareem had a lot of profound experiences there where I felt that he had come back into himself See, I didn't know Andrew before making this film. Obviously now we're, we're great friends, but, but um, Kareem, I saw the difference. Like he definitely got re earthed or re-found himself in the temple, you know? In, not in temple, in the film, in the, in the whole experience. Um, and obviously, because this is your second sort of feature film, how, how was it walking onto a set for a second movie? Was there a different feeling for, for yourself as a director when you walk? Because I guess with the first one, there's always that kind of um, nerves, maybe that kind of the butterflies, excitement. That's your first big feature. But did you walk on in a, as a as a different filmmaker? Would you say second time round? You know, it was so long since I'd made my first one. It was like nine, eight, eight years, nine years. So, um, and it was very different. It was like an American indie. So yes, it was an indie, but we're in New York. I mean, like this is like serious craft services, serious trucks. This is like a serious movie. I had like office floors, people. I mean, this was literally, I felt like I was almost back in film school. It was like me and some friends, everyone was carrying equipment. It was like, it was, it was brilliantly done because the Egyptians have such a big film industry that they are, the, the guy laid Dolly track in 10 minutes. I mean, wherever I go in the world, I'm getting that guy to come with me if I can get him a visa. Because that guy, I've never seen anyone. You know, like, like I'm sorry, it's gonna take like 50 hours to do this thing. No, it was like literally 10 minutes. He's like, I'm done. And it was like the best Dolly, I, I mean, amazing. Like, we had Dollies in this 18 day movie, you know, which is normally handheld, rubber, you know. But it was, it was, it was really, um, yeah, so weirdly, this was actually even more lo-fi than my first one. I just felt more like so excited to be on set again. It's really where like, I belong. I just love directing. I'm in my element. And, um, and um, I wasn't nervous. I was more like, I'm just focused that like everything wouldn't fall apart because it, me, me and Andrew on the first day laughed. At, we, we, you know, we, didn't, we just met literally the few days before. And we were laughing that it was like 40 towers sometimes, you know, like it was just <laughs> what was going on. But we, we managed and, and um, it was pretty amazing. So. So my, my final question, because I feel as I'm coming up to time, is just really what's, what's next for you then? Have you got any sort of projects underway? Because I've really enjoyed Luxor, so I'm looking forward to seeing whatever you, whatever you step into next. So um, I have quite a lot because obviously in the last you know, it's, I, Imperialist was made in 20, yeah, and I think 2009, it came out 2010, Sundance 2010, and then 2011 in cinemas. It, um, in the US, it, it, I've written a lot of scripts since then. And it's like, they're all kind of going to be made at some point. It just depends about the pandemic. So I'm thinking of maybe this film I may, I'm going to make maybe, um, there's a, a really fun English country house, subverting the English country house genre that I really want to do. Um, and I've been wanting to do it for years. And there's um, a film in, in Paris 
that I really want to make with Elodie Boucher from my first film. It's funny, if you if you see my first film, it's going to come out now on iTunes. It's going to be like, we um, we put out there with um, when Luxor comes out. It's called The Empiricist Still Alive. And it, I think you're going to be able to find it in the normal kind of outlets. Um, I recommend watching that because I'm actually like quite, a, I'm quite, um, I'm really, like, I enjoy and I can do comedy. And, and so Luxor was sort of like, um, <laughs> one of my friends, <laughs> one of my friends is having a hard time in Colombia. He's my best friend from NYU grad film. And I sent him the film and he's like, Zena, are you like seriously depressed or something? Like, I mean, <laughs> like, you're so funny. You're the funniest writer I know. Like, what's going on? What, why is this so sad? And, I'm, and he was so angry with me for making such a sad, but I mean, it was not so sad, but you know, I mean, he, because imperialist deals with things, but like in a more funny like manner and yeah so I, I feel like it's going to be like all the films are going to be like a mix of the two really the, the ones coming up we'll see but um I, I definitely that'll be quite a lot of comedy next oh, well if the I'm, last if, if Luxor had a feel on set of 40 Towers maybe next time you can do something actually has a feel of 40 Towers on screen that could be like that <laughs> Yeah, I'll bring that to the yeah. movie. Um, well, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. And I, I'm, I'm, I haven't actually seen your first film, so I, I am going to check that out. So did you say it's out on, is it coming out on like Netflix? Yeah, I think it's going to be like, I think the usual thing, I think it's going to be on like iTunes and okay. that kind of stuff coming out when, you know, when Luxor comes out yeah. so that people can, I thought it was important that like Luxor came out and then people also be able to see my other yeah, one. Yeah. Because it's weird. It's like out in the world, but it hasn't really come out here. It's, yeah. It had like a few ICA screenings or whatever, but mm, a, yeah, so. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I look forward to it. And thank you. So yeah, thanks again for your time today. And best of luck with, with whatever you do next with, with one of your many projects. But I look forward to seeing it. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey You Guys.